Good morning. It's Thursday the 11th of January here in London. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Europe podcast. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, after yesterday's faked approval, the SEC really does authorise a Bitcoin spot ETF for the first time. We have a special report on the secretive French agency blindsiding global investors. Plus a hot mic moment. Chris Christie shares unguarded thoughts on Haley and DeSantis as he bows out of the race for the US presidency. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. US regulators have for the first time approved exchange-traded funds that invest directly in Bitcoin. The move is being seen as a landmark event for the roughly $1.7 trillion digital asset sector and marks a rare capitulation by the SEC following more than a decade of opposition. The agency authorised 11 funds to begin trading as of today. Here's what SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce told Bloomberg. I'm delighted that we're at the end of this saga. Um, I know there's still there's still pieces of it to go, but I think this is a big milestone. The decision by Hester Pierce and her colleagues at the SEC come a day after the false post that the regulator's X account posted claimed that the agency had approved the ETFs. The Securities and Exchange Commission subsequently said the account had been compromised, causing the price of Bitcoin to fluctuate widely. Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey says that cryptocurrencies have lost momentum on their drive to become part of mainstream finance. Here's what he told a parliamentary committee on the subject. My own sense is that it's not taking off as a sort of what I might call a sort of core financial service. For instance, you know, using Bitcoin as a payments um, you know, method is, is pretty inefficient and it isn't taking off much. It, it's yeah, it's no doubt used in certain circles, but it's not taking off generally. I don't think the sort of the integration of it into the financial system has, has kept the momentum. Andrew Bailey, well, he also reiterated his long-standing view that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. The head of the New York Federal Reserve says interest rates are now high enough to bring down inflation. But John Williams also suggested policymakers need more evidence that price rises are slowing before they start easing. My base case is that the current restrictive stance in monetary policy will continue to restore balance and bring inflation back to our 2% longer run goal. I'll expect that we will need to maintain a restrictive stance of policy for some time to fully achieve our goals, and it will only be appropriate to dial back the degree of policy restraint when we're confident that inflation is moving towards toward 2% on a sustained basis. Williams added that any rate cuts would be dependent on the path of inflation and the economy. The New York Fed president's sentiment differs from comments that he made last month when he questioned whether monetary policy was sufficiently restrictive. The White House is backing legislation that would let it seize Russian wealth to help pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine. According to a memo from the National Security Council to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, President Biden's administration welcomes, in principle, a bill that would allow the confiscation of some $300 billion in frozen assets. The move represents a shift as the president attempts to rally support in Congress for further funding of Kyiv's counteroffensive. So far, Republicans have blocked more than $60 billion in funding for Vladimir Zelensky's forces, partly over concerns that Washington is carrying too much of the financial burden. The US Transport Secretary says Boeing's 737 MAX planes will remain grounded for some time to come. The aeroplane maker is facing intense scrutiny after a door plug ejected from a jet mid-flight last week. US regulators grounded 171 of the MAX of the 737 MAX 9 aircraft and ordered inspections after the accident. Pete Buttigieg told a transportation conference regulators need to deem the model safe to fly again. I made clear to the leadership of Boeing this week, this should never have happened in the first place. And the path for any plane in that category to return to service will be dictated by safety and only by safety. Buttigieg didn't give a timeline for the plane's return, but stressed the process would not be rushed. The former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie says that he is ending his long-shot presidential campaign centred on denying one-time ally Donald Trump the Republican nomination. Speaking at a town hall event in New Hampshire, Christie said there was clearly no path for him to win the nomination. However, before the event, Christie was caught on a hot mic undermining Trump's other Republican rivals, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley. Yeah, I mean, look, she's spent $68 million so far, just on TV. 
spent 68 million so far, 59 million by DeSantis, and we spent 12. I mean, who's punching above their weight and who's getting a return on their investment, you know? And she's going to get smoked. And you and I both know it. She's not up to this. Because she hasn't even been challenged. And she's still 20 points behind Trump in New Hampshire, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's going to, he's still going to carry out, right? Yes. Oh, he's, I, t- you know, I talked to, De- DeSantis called me, petrified that I would. He's probably getting out after Iowa. Well, So despite the unguarded comments by Christie, his exit still potentially boosts the candidacies of Haley and DeSantis, who have emerged as the main alternatives to front-runner Trump. Christie led Donald Trump's 2016 presidential transition team, but broke with him shortly after the 2020 election when Trump refused to concede to President Joe Biden. Barclays is planning to unveil a new set of targets for returns and costs next month, along with its fourth quarter results. That says the bank adjusts to the continued slump in deal-making and trading revenue. Bloomberg's Tiwa Adebayo has the details. Barclays traders failed to live up to the previous year's record-breaking revenue during the fourth quarter of 2023. That's according to Barclays' head of investor relations, who blamed the continued drought of deals and capital markets activity. It's a problem shared with others in the sector, including Jefferies, which saw its fourth quarter earnings drop by over half compared to 2022. In response, Barclays says it will set new targets for returns, expenses and shareholder distributions along with cost-cutting to boost profitability. In London, Tiwa Adebayo, Bloomberg Radio. In a moment, we'll get more on what the approval of a Bitcoin ETF means for the cryptocurrency more broadly. But another story that caught our eye this morning about the power of passports. This is one of those rankings that comes up quite (laughs) regularly. But there is a bit of movement this time around because we've had now the top spot tied is is France, Spain and Italy. They've moved up the rankings slightly. Yes, I thought that was quite interesting that it's the European countries um, that have done well. So this is basically does your, how many countries does your passport allow you access to visa free well for the europeans those ones named 194 out of 227 destinations uh, if you want to know where the uk ranks you've got a british passport uh, fourth with access to 191 the us though seventh place staying there i think actually the most interesting thing about this data that is uh, put together by Henley and partners is that everyone has been getting easier Mm. access and easier travel because if you look at 2006 on average uh, the number of destinations that travellers had was 58 countries and now by 2024 it's 111 so a lot fewer visas required simply to travel around the world. Yeah it's certainly very interesting particularly in the the post-pandemic reflections on Mm. on travel and and relations uh, in that area as well so that's story that caught our eye this morning. But let's get back to our top story and the reaction to news that the SEC in the US has approved exchange-traded funds that invest directly in Bitcoin. We saw the token briefly surpass $47,000 in a muted market response. Let's get the details now from Suvastri Ghosh, who is our Asia crypto reporter. Suvastri Good morning to you. Great to have you with us on the programme. It does look like, looking at the market reaction, that the SEC move was already priced in. Talk us through how markets reacted to the news of this approval. Hi, good morning. Nice to be here. Yes, you're right. Like a large part of the, in fact, the entire part of the uh, uh, much anticipated move was priced in by the crypto markets. And we saw briefly, as you might rightly mention, Bitcoin uh, moving up, uh, past $47,000, but it trimmed some of its gains, uh, uh, largely because, you know, the the sell on the news kind of trades that are that are being seen now. Uh, going ahead, we expect uh, some more corrections. Uh, th- that's what traders are telling us, and that's because uh, you know the, the the biggest part of the good news, the positive news, is out of the way, and there could be some profit taking going ahead. Is what we understand, unless there is a very big, major, uh, unexpected mm. positive news that comes in. Mm. So, what do you think it means then, a Bitcoin ETF longer term? Uh, for Bitcoin ETF, you know, so basically this is uh, this is like a democratization in a way of crypto, right? Where uh, you can expect traditional uh, traditional uh, firms, institutions, banks, pension funds, uh, they typically uh, invest uh, through passive funds, through ETFs. And uh, these kind of funds who typically did not so far directly buy uh, Bitcoin or other crypto assets might uh, look at uh, these uh, 
these markets, the Bitcoin, especially Bitcoin, uh, through the crypto, uh, through the Bitcoin spot ETFs. That actually means that you know there could be wider adoption, and the uh, fees could come down a lot, as we have seen anyway a fee wa- fee war wage. Uh, so yes, going ahead could be a broader adoption. However, I would like to add that a lot depends upon actually how much people believe that uh, this this market will last for a long time and therefore invest their money in these funds. So that that's a that's a caveat I need to uh, add over here. And an important one as well. So, Vashri, I, I wonder if we could just talk through a little bit of the decision-making process as well. What do we know about why the SET changed its mind and approved this ETF when it had been opposed to it for such a long time? Exactly, you know, and uh, so you're right, like for a, for more than a decade, uh, SEC has been opposing uh, ETFs, uh, spot ETFs, especially Bitcoin spot ETF. Uh, of what happened was, you know, in last August, there was a no, there was a court verdict uh, in the US where SEC lost a key legal fight against Grayscale Investments. Uh, now, Grayscale, if I can just add a context, is the, they have the biggest uh, fund, Bitcoin fund. And the case was basically where Grayscale Grayscale wanted their $29 billion uh, of Bit- Grayscale Bitcoin Trust to be converted into an ETF, so the the which which the SEC was against. So uh, the the court had quashed SEC's uh, you know uh, opposition. That was a main reason, one of the main reasons which uh, SEC Chairman uh, Gary Gensler Gensler said today that yesterday rather that uh, you know was a key reason for them to you know acquiesce and allow uh, the. ETF approvals, really. Yeah, it's a bit of a fascinating process, hasn't it? And one that's uh, been at the heart, really, of uh, the crypto industry for a long time. Thank you so much for being with us. Suvashri Ghosh, our Asia crypto reporter then on the US SEC approving Bitcoin ETFs. Now, the French President Emmanuel Macron has gone to extraordinary lengths to attract foreign capital to help revive the country's industry. But behind the scenes, he's also extended the reach of a secretive agency that's getting involved in any potential investment perceived as a risk to sovereignty. Joining us now for the details uh, from Paris, Bloomberg's economics reporter, William Harbin. William, good morning to you. This is agency is known as CISE. What is it and what powers does it have? Well, so CSE is it's an acronym that in French stands for Service for Strategic Information and Economic Security. It has a, a mission statement, um, which is to detect, characterize and handle threats to France's economic sovereignty. Specifically, it says that those it is mitigating against threats to three things. That's um, strategic businesses, critical technologies, um, research re- and research labs and institutions. Now, you might ask um, for uh, some examples of, of, of these, and there are lists um, that cover each of these categories, but actually um, CSA keeps those secret. Okay, so in terms of your reporting, how has this organisation's um, job changed in recent years? What have been some of their actions? Well, since its creation in 2016, CSA has seen a steady increase in its activity. But there was a particularly sharp acceleration after the COVID pandemic, um, and uh, it, it count it sort of counts the number of alerts that it deals with every year. Um, and they've um, that's the treble um, to about nine hundred last year. Um, so what happens when it gets an alert? Um, it sort of acts as a control tower for the whole of the French state. Um, for example, it could organise a task force if it identifies a risk to. Um, Theft of sensitive data. Uh, in the case of um, a hostile move to buy a strategic company, it will coordinate the action of other parts of the state, look for alternative buyers potentially if the threat is deemed to be material, um, or advise companies on how deals need to be changed or approved or whether they might be, whether they could be blocked. It can't actually, doesn't have powers to block outright, but it has a very strong dissuasive threat because it can make recommendations to the finance minister who can arbitrate in any potential deal. As well as as well as having sort of officials in Paris, it also has agents around the country who are gathering into economic intelligence on the ground on a more micro scale. So this increased scrutiny by CSE is coming at the same time that Emmanuel Macron is trying to open up France to foreign investors. How do those two objectives or those two trends marry? The heightened screening process might seem a bit intimidating, but 
CISA is actually also there to make the process easier. Officials say companies increasingly are coming to them to get advice on what's possible and what's not. That, that can potentially make huge savings, due diligence fees or legal fees. And actually, you know, some officials say this, you know, this sort of, sort of like more clearer landscape makes France a more attractive place to, to invest. You know, they, they become, at the same time, more cautious. And as I said, during the pandemic, they, they said there were lots of investors who were and with deep pockets coming from abroad who were sort of, you know, hovering over mm. or looking at French companies whose valuation tumbled during the lockdowns. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hill. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.